podcast. Thank you just so much for doing this. I know that I've been, um, I put a request a little while ago and I'm really happy that you made time because I, I don't know how, I think it was Bobby Ozinski's podcast is where I heard of you. And then I mm-hmm. went and I just sort of, I, I rabbit holed into pretty much everything that you have online, which is a lot, which is great. Um, so thank you so much for just making the time tonight. I'm like, I'm thrilled. And I, I've got um, some people, a community on Reddit, and they know about you too. And if they didn't, they do now. And they've asked some questions too. Cool. Um, okay. So I guess I'll just start off by sort of introducing you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have been mastering for 20 plus years. Uh, yep. You have two plugins on your name, uh, the Dynameter and Perception. You've got the production.co.uk website where you have the home mastering masterclass. You've got some ebooks there and other literature. You've established yourself as a bit of an internet sleuth. You're looking at Beyonce videos, you know, sort of. Oh, you found us. us. The, you really getting, have been getting, getting us the facts. Um, you're rubbing shoulders with uh, Steve Lillywhite and Bobby Ozinski. I guess the first question I have is why are you slumming it out on my channel? You know, you've come so far, Ian, why lower the bar in that? No, I'm, just, I'm not going to. That's not the question. But I'm a tot. I'm anybody's. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first question is, what are you drinking? This is the vodcast, so. Okay, so uh, this is Jura. Okay. Uh, Origin, I think. Um, could also have been Talisker. Uh, could have been Abelor. Any decent single malt. Gotcha. Um, and I, the dregs of a cup of coffee here. Gotcha. I think it was on the third show of the mastering show you mentioned eating, regretting eating a bit of chocolate and having some whiskey. So I'm like, good, he drinks. We can do this. That's the cutoff. <laughs> I, I apologize. I didn't pick up on the vodcast. I would have. There's an empty bottle of Absolute over there, but I don't have any in the house. So. Oh, I thought you. I thought you said you would have never done the show if that was the title. Okay. Oh no no. no. Oh good. Um, so I guess. I've scoured through, like I said, I've rabbit holed into a lot of your web material and stuff. So I, I don't want to ask too many questions that you've asked that you've answered elsewhere. I want to sort of be fresh and make things interesting. Um, but I, we do have to start from somewhere. So I wanted to say you are, and I mean this very politely, for better or for worse, known as the dynamic range day guy. I'm wondering how that came about and where things stand now in your quest to make music great again. I, I still think music's great. It's just too loud. Um... And, and loud in terms of the level, not in terms of the sound, right? There's a difference between sounding loud and just being loud. Um, so it came about because I started blogging in about 2008, and I did it as an experiment on Blogspot just for uh, just to see whether it would kind of encourage more clients to kind of come my way, to be honest. Um, you know, I had heard that because, you know, cold calling is not, my nice style you know and what i'd heard was that if you put out interesting content people would find you uh, maybe like what you were doing and, and consider asking you to do some work for them so that that was the experiment and i don't know how long i've been going but at some point i became aware that the new metallica album death magnetic was really really loud and distorted um and there was this fascinating situation where the the guy who mastered it had off the record said to a fan that he wasn't proud of the release uh which is kind of unheard of especially because the fan then went out and put it on the record for him um against his wishes uh but then the the other thing that happened was that there were two versions of that album out there was the cd release and there was the version that was used as part of the soundtrack for the guitar hero Mm -hmm. game the playstation 3 game and the the unique thing about that album was that they sent the stems off for that game six, eight months prior to the final CD being released. So there was a much cleaner, uh, much more dynamic, like there's a huge difference between that version, uh, something like 10 dBs difference in level uh, between the final release CD and the versions that were available on the Guitar Hero game. So the fans got hold of this stuff and started talking about it. And I became aware of the story and I just, did a post on my blog about it because I thought it was it was kind of fascinating. In fact, when I first did it, I don't know whether the Guitar Hero version was even out there. I was just talking about the fact that it was such a... At that point, it was one of the loudest albums I'd ever heard. Um, since then, it's people have gone louder. Um, and that got picked up by, 
I think it was Music Radar first, and then Wired Magazine, and then the Wall Street Journal, and the Guardian newspaper here in the UK. And it just it just went everywhere, and I had one of those viral spikes in the traffic to my my little blog. Um, and from then on, people have been, uh, you know, interested in the topic and interested in my opinions on it. And and so, you know, I've, I mean, it's it's funny because I remember saying to my colleague Simon Murphy at the time, he was a Metallica fan, um, and he was saying, look please go easy on them. You know, it's, it's still a great album, uh, despite all of this controversy. Um, and I tried to respect that wish, but also I, I remember saying to him at the time, I, I don't want to just be the loudness guy. Um, and I guess whatever it is, eight or nine years later, I'm going to have to accept that I am the loudness guy. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Basically it was, it was that kind of, I mean, I'd always been interested in the topic. I mean, all mastering engineers, Ah, you know, in the early days of my training, it was, well, how do I achieve the loudness that I hear on uh, commercial releases and on the big, biggest releases out there? And then at some point in the late, late 90s, early 2000s, it was, why would I want to achieve that? <laughs> Hearing some of the examples that were coming out, you know, because right. that's when it kind of the whole thing just jumped the shark. Um, and... I mean, everybody was talking about it. Everybody was discussing the pros and cons and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, and yeah, so it, it was just kind of a natural extension from then on. And, it, you know, the thing is, I mean, these because I, you know, you said I'm the Dynamic Range Day guy. I set up Dynamic Range Day. That's now been going for six years. Going um, strong. It, well, going strong. I kind of wish I could almost let it go at this point, okay. um, you know, because it's a huge amount of work to to put it all together um it's a real challenge it's it's getting harder and harder to find new things to say right. um it, there's no question it's had an impact which is fantastic and i'm very proud of it um but i kind of wonder whether that's gone as far as it can go now and maybe my efforts are better focused on the plugins which because because these are these are tools that enable people to experience the effects of of loudness or not for themselves and you know what i find is that when people actually do this stuff themselves that's when they change their behavior you can kind of tell them stuff and show them stuff all day long and people go yeah that's really interesting and then carry on doing what they were doing but when they actually you know if people actually so my my big recommendation is once you've mastered your stuff you know or had it back from the mastering engineer load it into itunes enable sound check and then compare it with other stuff mm -hmm. because sound check will even out the loudness differences just like happens everywhere else these days. Um, and then you hear realistically how most people are going to hear that music. And, and that's the thing that really opens people's eyes. Um, that and using perception or watching what Dynameter says. So having said all that, I can't not do Dynamic Range Day now because people expect it. You know, that's, right. It's got this kind of following um, people email me all the time asking me when the next one's going to be, what I'm going to be doing, and all the rest of it. So, I think my challenge now is to just to find a way of making it. Uh, I, I think I'd like to try and make it more open source, so that I get more people involved, so that it, it kind of sustains itself rather than needing me to push it every year. But w whether I'll achieve that or not is a, right. you know, remains to be seen. Well, on the on that topic of of the surge of interest in loudness and loudness levels and dynamics and dynamic range. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the bizarre spike in interest in the art of mastering itself. And I say art just to use a word that might work, the the process of mastering, the artistry and mastering, because it seems like there were a couple plug-in companies um, that were making uh, some mastering stuff, and then Isotope sort of landed with Ozone. And then there's just the ball sort of rolled. And the channel that I run is mostly 70% sort of composing based, but even composers are asking me all about how do I master my tracks? And they, they have a very good understanding of what goes into mastering. They're not just coming to me saying, well, it's how I make something super loud, right? Like they understand that it's about having a consistent um, experience across output formats and blah, blah, blah. So what do you think, I mean, and you're very well positioned for this, you and your, your, your show and your website, did you see something sort of coming? Did you? Did you sort of smell the prevailing winds and they were saying that mastering is going to be big? And what do you think accounts for it? I, I actually think I did. Um, I guess that's easy to say with hindsight. Uh, 
Right. Um, the thing that um, the, the moment where I thought, wait a minute, was when TC Electronic released the finalizer. So the finalizer was the consumer version of their M5000 um, hardware unit, which was a it was a reverb and dynamics and uh, uh, three or four different processing modules in it. And actually you had cards that you could plug in depending on which uh, modules you wanted to use. We were using that from the get go. Um, they, uh, and then they released the finalizer, which, and, and it, it was, it was one of these kind of, you know, silly money kind of processes, but the finalizer was affordable and aimed at the consumer market and offered people presets. So that was the first time that the kind of processing that mastering engineers had been used to for about 10 years was available at a price that consumers could afford. And I had kind of, so f I had watched, um, kind of while I was a student and in the first years that I was uh, a professional mastering engineer, watched the, you know, the, um, the prosumer market in terms of the home recording mm -hmm. kind of come through. You know, I'd, I remember, so uh, show my age, I was a fan of Ultravox when I was okay. a kid. Um, and I remember Midjour um, being, he did his first solo album after Ultravox split and he had set up a little MIDI studio in his, uh, he converted a room in his house for his garage or something, you know, and I remember him being in an interview saying it used to be that a studio was completely unattainable for anybody. Now you can buy one for a sensible amount of money and have it in your house. And that was the kind of the beginning of that trend that, that you know, ultimately has led to where we are now, where you can have a, effectively an entire recording studio in your laptop. Um, and I remember kind of thinking, well, it's inevitable that's going to happen for mastering as well. And the finalizer was the the moment where that was the kind of tipping point, as far as I was concerned, where, okay, this is going to happen. Um, it doesn't surprise me that people are interested in mastering because I think it's a really, I mean, clearly, I think it's a really fascinating topic and a really fascinating subject. And it's just an extension of everything else. You know, if, you, if you're interested in recording, why wouldn't you be interested in mixing and, and mastering as well? Because mastering is just that final stage in the process i do think it has almost got more hype than it deserves in some ways um because and i think that's because when i was first trained nobody knew what it was the company that i worked for uh we also offered manufacturing people would phone up saying i want to have some cds pressed or i want to have some vinyl pressed and we would say okay have you had it mastered and they'd kind of go well what's what's that and you would explain to them about mastering mm -hmm. and um probably hopefully sell them that, that that as part of the package um persuade them that that was going to be beneficial for the for the result for their end result um so at that point you know i was doing attended sessions with people and they would come in with no idea at all what to expect uh and and so it was very much a kind of you know just explaining how it worked and what you could achieve and why you would want to do it they all obviously went away converted um and i think that process you know the the magazines like sound on sound and future music and the the kind of the the home recording press once the tools were there that would enable people to do it they started offering information on how people could do it themselves um and yeah the whole thing just kind of snowballed naturally um so yeah i think it's kind of a natural process and and i just figured out early on that you know there are always going to be because I'm a professional mastering engineer. If if you ask me what the absolute best for your music is, I should say you should come to someone like me. Um, but I also recognise that not everybody wants to do that. You know, there are people who are just as fascinated with it as I am. Um, and you know, it's it is possible to get great results mastering your music yourself or in a home studio, whatever. It's really hard, um, but it's quite possible. And if people are going to try and do that, I would prefer that they do a good job of it than the not you know and there's so much uh, what in my opinion is bad information out there um that's what i wanted to to counter with the, the stuff that i was offering yeah well i think it's true that it's sort of inevitable that someone's going to be interested in mastering because at the end of the day you've maybe you paid for studio time 
you've paid for maybe a session player, you've done all you can to mix your track properly, and then you get to this point where you go, well, how come it's not as loud as my favorite song? And someone goes, well, that's that has probably something to do with mastering. And then you go, okay, well, what is that? So on the topic of loudness, um, I don't know if you've uh, heard of this study. I've only become aware of it recently. It's uh, it's by Emmanuel Darity, and he basically studied if you from people for people who don't know from I think I guess 1967 to 2014 he did like a longitudinal study measuring all kinds of loudness factors and surmised that basically things were very 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 loud and getting louder and then they peaked in 2007 and we're sort of slowly on our way down um, from that and I think he said in 10 to 15 years we'll get back to a comfortable level um, I'm wondering what you think happened. What was the X marks the spot point in, in 2007? Was it an awareness that things are too loud? Was it, uh, yeah, I, I guess if you could theorize on that. That's a good question. Um, I think I might have had something to do with it. Okay. <laughs> at, the, at the risk of sounding arrogant. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that literally. I just mean the whole, I mean, 2008, I think, is when Death Magnetic came out. It was either 2008 or 2009. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of the loudest. And there was a huge amount of publicity. I think that that caused a huge increase in awareness, maybe not in the kind of the world at large, but, you know, in, in our circles where people, you know, doing home recording or the prosumer studios and stuff. Um, I'm also, I mean, Emmanuel's done some great work. Um, the, I'm... What I see at the moment, people people are always asking me whether things are getting better or worse. Mm. I'm seeing it being more polarized. The loud stuff I'm seeing is just as loud and probably louder and worse sounding, I would say. Um, that's the really loud stuff. Then the kind of just bog standard by the numbers loud pop releases are just there doing their thing. And I don't see those levels declining but then i see this other trend of stuff that's coming up that is more dynamic of people who are taking advantage of this stuff um in the mainstream like that um, like maybe so, like that james blake record that you uh, talked about like the website. james blake record yeah. like uh uptown funk like mm -hmm. get lucky um like you know what stephen wilson is doing um there's actually i'm not gonna be able to reel them off by um heart but i could actually I have a playlist on Spotify. I'll, I'll make um, sure to include that in the show notes, a link to that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, so Drake is, a, is an artist who's interesting, who's, you know, seriously mainstream and in a genre that is kind of known for extreme loudness. Mm. And his stuff is not extremely loud. It's still loud, mm. um, but it's not right up there. So, yeah, I do see these kind of two parallel kind of lines running through. Um, and they're kind of they're kind of getting further apart. I think loudness normalization has had uh, a big role to play. I don't know when exactly Spotify came into the scene. Spotify is the first kind of major streaming platform, obviously, and they have always used loudness management. So they measure, they assess the loudness of everything that they play, and by default, unless you turn it off, they will turn loud songs down and they'll turn quiet songs up just to, to give people a better listening experience because the, the number one source of complaint from anybody um, listening to music anywhere is when the, the volume leaps up and down. You know, the last thing you want is to suddenly not be able to hear a song or to get blasted out by the next one after a quieter song. So they did it first. I think Pandora have been doing it for ages. Apple have Soundcheck, which they used to use on iTunes radio until that was stopped. Um, now YouTube are doing it. Tidal are now doing it. I think the only major platform that isn't doing it right now is SoundCloud. Um, and I've spoken to their technical support team and, and they're saying it's on the list. And actually, they've just been acquired by Spotify. Right. So I, I imagine that's not far off either. So the point about that is not that it undoes any of the damage of kind of extreme loudness processing, but just that it, it, it re removes the, the, um, the temptation to make stuff really loud because you make it really loud in the file or on the CD and then it gets uploaded to one of these services and it gets turned down again. It plays back at the same level. You've lost the any advantage there might have been to, to master it, to the loud mastering. And uh, you've also lost the advantage that you can get from having more dynamics, more space to move, you know, because 
it's always a balance. Uh, stuff um, doesn't want to be too quiet either. You can have things that are too dynamic. Um, it's about finding the sweet spot, in my opinion. Which um, people can achieve with, I think, the dynameter, right? Or is it perception? You can kind of come um, close they're, to measuring well, they're, they're, They both uh, help you do that um, in different ways. So perception helps you hear. Um, it loudness matches the before and after comparison of what you're working on so that you can make a fair comparison and hear the, the effects of whatever it is you're doing without being fooled by the loudness. Um, and Dynameter gives you a visual indication um, and you can choose from some presets depending on what your what your goals are um, to try and help you. So it, it pleases me that someone like Emmanuel is finding a trend downwards in levels. Um, I think that's a kind of an averaging effect and I think it's going to take longer. I'm, I'm very optimistic that over time the effects of loudness management and increased awareness of the problems you know because one of the big things about the death magnetic issue is just that people became very aware of the negative aspects prior to that you know i mean they had had people like me mastering engineers saying well you want to be loud so that you can compete with the competition so that but that was before we kind of went over i, I talk about this thing called the loudness cliff if you think of loudness as being like a mountain that everybody wants to climb, you know, you want to be at the top of the mountain. You want to be at the same height as everybody else. Um, as you get towards the top of the mountain, it gets harder and harder and harder to get any higher because the top of the mountain starts rolling off, right? So you put in extra effort and you don't get as far. And if you go too far, you fall off the cliff and you get smashed on the rocks down on the other side. Um, and I think people hadn't been aware up until that point of of the penalty of pushing it too far. And I think death magnetic and some other releases kind of really pointed that up um i also think this stuff has filtered down into the music education system so a lot of people who i get a lot of people who music technology lecturers um contacting me through the site um and through what i do and i know that they're all very aware of this issue and making their students aware of it mm -hmm. so i think you know all of these things kind of together add up to hopefully uh what we're going to see is a, a reduction in this, the, the whole thing. Um, but we're not there yet. Well, getting back to something you said about your sort of careful optimism with respect to whether or not we're sort of getting back to a place where things are at a good level for loudness. I wonder if that's in any way informed by the fact that you're very much on the front lines. You're still getting mixes from people who want their stuff mastered. Um, and I'm wondering what you're hearing without, I guess, making any clients feel bad, but what are you hearing? What do you? What, what's your sense of whether or not people uh, are getting the message that let's make sure we have a lot of headroom for our mastering engineer. Let's make sure that we have a dynamic and not a, a super compressed sound when we get it out the other end of uh, of the process. Well, again, I think it, there's there's two sides to it. So, I mean, on the one hand, I'm lucky because I'm I have a public profile talking about this stuff. I get people coming to me who who want. To work with me because they know that i care about dynamics and because that you know i'm going to get them a great result in that sense so that means i get less of the people who want the stuff super loud anyway right. um i'm also doing less major label work than I, I used to do since i set up on my own so i'm working more with independence i'm more working more directly with artists rather than talking to people in offices um uh, bobby azinski interviewed a mastering engineer just on the one of his recent shows mm -hmm. um he's doing a load of major label stuff and he says there's no reduction in the trend at all as far as he's concerned everybody still wants it really really loud um in terms of what i see coming in i see either people who are aware of all the issues and are giving me something that's really dynamic to begin with or i see people who actually probably don't know about it or know about it and, and don't care so th the flip side of it is I see a lot of stuff that is just really, really hot at the mixing stage. You know, people are using plugins on the master bus. They're doing kind of quotes self mastering or they've put a limiter on to try and lift the level up. Um, and quite often then I kind of request, can you try and give me a version that is less squashed to begin with? And then they say, just, oh, I'll take it off the master. I'll take it off the stereo bus, but should I take the limiters off the uh, vocals and drums and everything else too? Uh, no to be fair okay. usually it's 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 mostly on the master bus okay um the, the 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 most common scenario i see is when they do that they send me something it's about six eight dbs lower uh it sounds a whole lot better 
the irony then is that I take it back towards where they had it because that's what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem is I'm hearing all kinds of uh, negative effects of the way that they did it. Um, like just for a simple example, if you don't process stuff with a balanced EQ going into compression and limiting where you're trying to achieve a great result mastering, you're not going to get optimal results from that processing. You know, an unbalanced EQ is going to cause far more problems when you push the level high than um, something with a balanced EQ. So, yeah, nine times out of ten, what happens is I send them back something that sounds maybe a little bit less loud than what they had, but way better in loads of other ways. And uh, so far, I've never had anybody ask me to go with their version in terms, you know, you know, as a source material. Um, they don't want me to use their crushed version going in to get the results that I want to get. They always prefer the version where I've done the mastering, the the, the dynamic management to achieve that final level. So, so I, guess, I, I guess my next question would be, what would you say to someone who maybe doesn't have um, the status that you do as someone who cares deeply about dynamics? What would you say to the emerging mastering engineer who feels that they can't sort of positively contribute to the artistry of their process because they can't make a quiet master? How would you tell them to sort of negotiate those obstacles with their clients? It's really tough. Um, you know, I mean, the the first thing is to, to use the iTunes trick, which is not a trick. Uh, you know, it's so if they want a super hot master, do a super hot master and say, okay, here it is. This is the best I can do. Mm. But do me a favor, load it up in iTunes, enable sound check, and then compare it with some other stuff. In fact, even better is to send them two masters. Send them one that's really loud, and then another version, another version that is right in the sweet spot, the perfect balance, and get them to just compare those two. And what they will hear is they play back with identical loudness, but the more dynamic one will sound better because it has more space to have punch and weight in the drums and you know a more open a fuller more three-dimensional sound it'll have more life more energy in it when it's played with the the loudness matched um that that works i mean that's what the mastering engineer who mastered the james blake album that's what matt colton did uh when he was talking to james's management to his a and r he he went through that whole process and they kind of already knew about soundcheck in iTunes. Um, so they they said, well, okay, so is there a downside? And he said, well, no. You know, I mean, yes, if you put this CD on in comparison to another CD and don't adjust the the volume control, but, you know, nobody listens to CDs anymore. No. Um, so they, they kind of, they said, okay, fine, we'll do what, you know, what James wants. We'll do the, the right thing artistically. So that approach works. So that's my, that's my first suggestion. They can also try showing them some of the videos on my site that demonstrate this stuff. Absolutely, but yeah. to be honest, it's more likely to be uh, effective, just like I was saying before, if it's a practical, if they can hear the difference in their music between the two versions, that's going to be the most persuasive uh, argument for them. Um, if that doesn't work, then you, you have two options. You either do what they ask and master it, as they want and get the best result you can. And that's in no way, um, that's an absolutely valid way to proceed. Uh, you know, I mean, Bob Ludwig, who is probably the best known, the most famous mastering engineer in the world, um, and who is a passionate advocate for dynamics in music, is a supporter of Dynamic Range Day. Um, he offers different versions to his clients. So there's the really loud version, there's the sweet spot version and there's the even more dynamic version he lets them choose and if they choose the louder version that's the version that gets released um so that's one way of doing it for me personally i i just i don't get any satisfaction from doing that um so i, I i'm honest with people and i say you know this isn't what i enjoy doing you know you if if, if really loud mastering is is important to you you're probably going to get a better result going to someone else so you know um you know i think i respectfully a, decline yeah and, go on oh no after you go ahead well i mean that that's the next thing whenever i tell people that they kind of go well you mad you're turning away work um and i mean the answer is yes in the short term but 
I've never had a bad reaction. I don't think I've ever had a bad reaction to that. Um, you know, worst case, they kind of go, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's it. You, you, lost you just send them a link to your website and you go, let that guide the focus for the rest of this conversation. Well, I mean, I'm it's, just, I'm just kidding. you know, the, 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 like I say, it's so rare that that happens. What, what's much more common is that they, they say, um, well, either they say, well, look, go on, we've, we started this conversation, show us what you would do anyway. So I do my master and I send it to them and they go, well, that sounds great. And it's perfectly loud enough. Um, or they go, okay, well, thank you. We respect your honesty, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and either they come back with a future album or they recommend somebody else they know who's not so fixated on loudness. Um, you know, you, I get stuff coming in and saying, oh, it's recommended by so-and-so. And I think, well, I didn't actually master their album, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I just, that works for me. Um, having said that, I'm lucky I have other revenue streams, right? I have the plugins, yeah. I have the website, um, so I'm selling info products there, I'm making money. I'm not 100% working uh, as a mastering engineer these days. If I was, I might have a different approach. Um, but, you know, it's, I think the risk is if you put a ton of time and effort into getting great results mastering loud, you're going to get known for doing great work mastering loud and you're going to get more people coming to you because they want loud records. Um, and the risk is that you just, you know, you find yourself squeezed into that. Whereas I have the opposite thing where I'm known for not doing super dynamic stuff. You know I mean? I, my stuff is still competitive. Um, it's in fact, it's often louder than people expect. I occasionally have people ask me to turn stuff down um, because they expect something even more dynamic than what I think is the perfect balance. Um, but you know it, it, i think overall it, it it works out it's 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 good it's good for me to have a niche um and that works for me and it means that i'm genuinely proud of the stuff that i'm working on and i'm proud of the results and i don't have it you know i don't have to listen to it and kind of go oh i wish you know this that or the other um and yeah so you know everybody has to find their own way through it but it is it is difficult well, that's actually – you've just answered a question that I had for you, which was do you think – it was kind of a Barbara walter -y kind of personal question. Do you think your work has ever suffered as a result of your stance on dynamics? But you've answered it, and I would add that if anything, as we go forward and as the levels come down, I think, and the streaming platforms go up, I think people are going to be looking for mastering engineers like you and others who can negotiate the obstacles of – well, this uh, playback format iTunes has a certain LUFS cutoff and loudness normalization thing, and Spotify has this one. And I think a lot of mastering engineers out there, especially emerging ones or even maybe established ones, uh, don't really know how to make things sound good on those platforms. Well, it's there are different aspects to it. I think in some senses you're right. I think actually the vast majority of mastering engineers would be more comfortable mastering at the kind of levels that I recommend and that I stick to. Right. Um, I think they would be delighted with the opportunity to uh, t to back off slightly. And I think they could all do a great job with those levels. I mean, you know, there, there have been times when I've mastered something. Uh, in fact, at one point somebody sent me, sent me a, a song to do a demo of. I didn't realize it had actually already been mastered. Um, hmm. My master was almost indistinguishable from the master they had already had done. I mean, like literally it was within half a dB. The EQ balance was very, very similar. You know, you'd be, I'm not convinced that if I'd been given the two blind, I would be able to say which was which. Um, and, you know, there, I think there is a great deal of consistency if mastering engineers are left to their own devices to do what they need to do. Um, I mean, the other thing to say is that there are two approaches with the different streaming services. Either you do optimized versions for each platform or currently my personal preference is still to do one master that works perfectly well on CD, on vinyl, for streaming, wherever. I, that's the way that I was taught, and I believe that that's possible. Um, you know, I mean, if you want to turn the limiter, the thing is, because I never, for, for example, you could turn the limiter off on some of my stuff and get a few dBs of peak headroom back. Um, it wouldn't sound substantially different because I never use the limiter so hard that it radically changes the sound. Um, part of the way that I work is to make sure that the limiter is not working too hard. So um, 
I, in that sense, again, any mastering engineer, if, if they're going to work that way, should be able to achieve. I, I kind of think it's slightly disingenuous to offer, say to somebody, oh, well, you need four or five different masters for different formats. You know, back in the day, mm. <clears throat> that was a huge part of the mastering uh, uh, workflow. The, you know, the, the, because you had to have, you literally had physically separate masters for the CDs, for the cassettes, right. for the vinyl, whatever. So c creating the physical copies that were going to use for all, be used for all those different formats was a big part of the job. Um, and I, you know, I did that myself, you know, multiple, uh, 1630, uh, umatic tapes that would go, you know, one to Japan, one to us, one for the UK, all that kind of stuff. These days, it's a file, you know, you can send the file to anywhere. I mean, it, if it's going to go to vinyl, it has to be cut. If it's going to be used on CD, it has to be pressed. There are still little bits there, but, but those are both very small parts of the market now. Um, you know, the vast majority of it is for streaming and all the rest of it. And I think you can produce a master that's optimized for any of those formats. So, you know, that's, that's the way that I work. So you're right. There might be some opportunities in future, but I think, the I think the real opportunity is understanding now what makes stuff sound great. You know, one of the things I know that I can be proud of is that a master that I do is still going to sound fantastic in five or ten years' time. Um, maybe by then the trend will be for much more dynamic things, and people will think it's you know it could have had a little bit more yeah. room to breathe. But it's I don't, I don't think so because when I look back in history, even some of the classic stuff from the the seventies and eighties, it's not hugely different in terms of the the overall dynamics um because you know what sounds good has always sounded good will always sound good well this gets um, to the a, problem is right now that people are doing stuff that doesn't this gets to a question i had about you know past and present and stuff i see the word remastered all the time and i think i have a pretty good understanding of what it means i was listening i was getting back into talk talk uh, and uh, blue nile and there seems to be all these you know remaster tags on it so maybe help us Help us understand what we should think about when we see the word remastered. What should go through people's heads? Well, there's what should go through people's heads, and there's what what does go through people's heads as a result. So I've done a ton of remastering mm -hmm. over my, my career. And uh, when I'm doing remastering, uh, you ideally you get the original tape, you know that the the thing was mixed to that the 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 original format whatever it was the original files whatever and it's a completely fresh take that's the ideal in <laughs> practice yeah. quite often what you get is the last time it was out on cd or a cassette master as opposed to a cd master or a dub from another reel or very common when you're doing uh back catalog is to get the the production master for vinyl. So it's been EQ'd to tape for vinyl production, um, which is not appropriate for digital formats necessarily. Um, so quite often you're kind of retrospectively correcting for something that was done before. But I mean, regardless of what you're supplied, the goal is to create the best possible version you can with modern technology. So, you know, these days we have better to analog to digital converters. Um, we have better digital processing than was available when I first started working, better restoration tools. Um, and if you look at something that's sort of the gold standard, I mean, I think the the Beatles remasters right. um, from five or six years ago are fantastic because they sound exactly as you expect in terms of the recordings that you've known for so long just better you know there's more clarity there's more space uh there's more detail and you know every so often the, the, the just the way that it sounds uh works even better than you remember that's that's the ideal for remastering the problem is that's not what a lot of people are doing when they remaster things a lot of remastering these days is trying to squeeze these old kind of formats into this modern super loud box so uh, my favorite well, my least favorite example is uh, Soundgarden. Um, their albums were remastered a few years ago. You know, the originals sound fantastic. The new versions, I, I prefer everything about the original releases. They're more dynamic. Uh, 
the EQ on the modern ones sounds thick and muddy to me, uh, congested. There's some distortion creeping in. There's some pumping in there because of excessive loudness processing. You know, I just I listen to it and I go, well, that's the remaster has made it sound worse, which is the exact opposite of what the goal of remastering should be, which is to make it sound better. So I would like to think that people kind of see the the label, you know, digitally remastered on something and feel hopeful still that they're going to hear a version that is even better than the one they already have in their same their recording at their collection. But I think the reality is it's a bit of a, a lottery, you know, um, I think some I, of them I actually do sound fantastic and some of them just don't. I actually know the engineer on uh, the Soundgarden record, the guy who remastered it. I think it's something uh, Lander. I'm just kidding. Right. That's a, that's a joke. Um, we can talk about Lander in a little bit. Um, you have to? <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, this kind of feeds into what I was going to ask, which was th there seem to be a lot of tools now. Um, tools that, again, getting back to this for better or for worse, there's a good and a bad kind of automate and digitize the process. There is uh, there there is Lander and Cloud Bounce. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, there's Isotope's new Neutron plugin, which if you press a button, it will suggest some compression and EQ um, settings for you. There's Waves. They've that's got more this. mixing than mastering, though. That's true. But I would bet some money that they might put it into Ozone, some of that machine learning and, uh, and stuff. Um, you've got Waves with their headphone thing that can recreate a room for you. I'm wondering given your years in the industry, what do you see as part of the mastering process? What do you think should be just totally left alone? You know, it should just remain unadulterated. You can't recreate this with a plugin or whatever. What do you think should just always be, you know, stay the same, so to speak, if that makes sense? I think. Um, I, 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 I don't have a problem with any of these tools, you know. Um, I mean, I haven't tried Neutron, but I've seen... The, the demo video, I think it's a really clever idea. Mm. Um, I'm kind of looking at it and going, oh, is there something I can do along those lines for mastering? Um, it's my big problem is that the, all of these things say that they're mastering, right? Lander says on its website, you know, it's prof have your tracks professionally mastered in a matter of seconds for only a few dollars. That's the bit that I have a problem with because it's not mastering. Right, mastering is the process of having your music assessed and worked on by a mastering engineer. That's a human um, who understands the emotion, the the musical intent. Uh, you know, who who know, there's a point when you get uh, any master with a beat where you suddenly everybody in the room starts nodding. <laughs> you know, and that's when it's working. And a machine doesn't know that, can't know that. Um, and I, I mean. It, Funnily enough, I'm, I'm a bit of a science nerd. I'm actually really fascinated by the whole idea of uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm really interested in the whole concept of whether a machine, in theory even, could ever do what a human does. You know, they can play chess. Uh, they can, to some extent, translate languages, all kinds of things that in the past were science fiction. Will they one day be able to do stuff? I mean, I think what's surprising about things like Lander is actually how not bad it is, you know? And, and I have to admit, there is a, a large chunk of what we do in the uh, in the mastering profession that does feel as though it can be automated. You know, uh, you can measure the loudness, and you can adjust it, um, and you can choose how much limiting should be used, if any, as part of that process. You can assess the overall EQ balance and uh, make it more even if it has any kind of obvious lumps and bumps in it. Uh, absolutely, that's. But it's, I think the thing for me is when I'm mastering over and over and over again in my career, you know, you, you work on something for half an hour or an hour and you think, oh, that's as good as it is. Um, and then either you go away and do something else or you just kind of play it one more time and you say, yes, it's not quite. And you go in there and you'll just tweak something by like literally there was one song that I mastered recently where I just thought it's a shame the snare doesn't pop out a little bit more and that's a mixing decision i just thought well i'll just try and i put this tiny little narrow boost in at 200 hertz or something right where the kind of the, the snare was speaking and it had this huge impact it really did make the snare feel like it was pushing out of the mix more uh, and it didn't mess anything else up um and you know if you'd have asked me 
two minutes before and I said, I don't think that's going to work. And it did. And those kind of tiny little details that make that all that difference, you, tiny little changes on every track over the whole course of a whole album add up to this huge overall effect. Even when you're just tiny, just doing tiny little level adjustments from one song to another. And I just don't see that a machine is ever going to get a handle of that. So as far as I'm concerned, if it's automated, it's not mastering. You could call it uh, optimized optimization or, um, you know, automated post production or something, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, just, just don't call it mastering. Call it mastering. Um, that's, that's, that, that's really my bottom line. And that's my big beef with Lander. I mean, I have to say they, because I've I've did a video about Lander on the site uh, when it first came out, and uh, the guys there reached out to me, and they're very friendly, and they genuinely, you know, they they recognise that they are being pushed by the market to do things that they don't think are necessarily optimal for the music, because they're kind of saying the one question we just keep getting from everybody about it is why isn't it louder? Hmm. Um, given that they're in the business of giving people what they want and you know they're it's a kind of stack it high sell it fast process you know it's a, the lander's business model is about volume not well, i don't want to say not about quality but it's when you're not charging that much and it's an automated process <laughs> uh you know it's it's just kind of natural that they they have to give people what they want if people try it out for free and don't like the results you're doomed you know if you go to a professional mastering engineer they send you back a, a an example master and you kind of you're not quite happy you say well could we just do this? and then you have a conversation and you end up with something that everybody's happy with um you're not going to get that with a machine especially one that has no adjustable settings like lander so th they are some of what they're doing is driven they feel like they're they're kind of they they're powerless to do anything about it um and yeah, they were even interested in getting me involved to try and get better results. And I, I thought quite hard about it because it is quite an intriguing problem. You know, how, how good can you get it? How good can you make a machine at doing this stuff? And it's quite an intellectual challenge. And at, and at just some point, I kind of stopped and thought, well, hang on, this is kind of the exact opposite of everything else that I'm about. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, it would be interesting and possibly fun and might even be lucrative. But actually, you know, I'm a mastering engineer and I want to achieve better results for people through mastering, not... Uh, not through the automation process. So, I mean, one thing I would say is I heard a demonstration of one, or I know I heard an interview with a guy, I forget the name, he designed an alternative. The difference with this was it was an analog mastering rig. I think that was on Bobby Ozinski's too. I think he interviewed. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is an interesting concept and it's different from what Lander is doing. And the, the, the thing that I thought was interesting about the way he was describing it, it was that he was saying that uh, he had clients who were using it who were, also mastering clients of his because he's a mastering engineer they would do a mix run it through this processing listen to what came back think oh, i'm not quite happy with that change what they put into the mix and run it through again and just keep iterating until they got something that they were happy with the difference being that they could do this at 2 a.m and because they had a deadline the following right. morning when their mastering engineer would be asleep right um and that you know, I have to admit, that's an interesting concept. It hadn't, uh, it really doesn't work for me in the sense of you kind of, you do put all your heart and soul into this mix, you send it off to Lander and you get something back and you just go, okay, that's it. But if you're going to kind of iterate and try and, it seems a bit crazy to me, you know, if you've been working still, if you've been working for days, weeks, months on getting the best possible result you can, and then you're kind of this kind of slightly random you know, thing where it's, well, let's see what this does. And now let's see what this does. And maybe this will do um, rather than a situation. But even then, I mean, if you had 10 masters done on Lander, it's still going to be cheaper than me doing it. Well, I was going to uh, say 10 masters on Lander. Well, heaven forbid you should work for a month, a year, two years on a whole album and then throw it through Lander. I mean, and expect any kind of consistency. Expect those songs to fit the same dress code of the album, so to speak, right? Well, well I think the thing is people do. Yeah. Um, and they're not i mean people are using it so the, mm. a certain number of people must be happy with it i again part of it is just upsets me that that means that people are going to more and more think that that's what mastering is right. rather than what i think mastering is which is you know 
a creative process and a conversation with the artist and uh you know just trying to get the the trying to have the intuition to understand what the the person who sent you the music is trying to achieve and trying to help them get closer to that um you know rather than just oh it needs this that the other boom done yeah move on so yeah it's I, I don't have a problem with the, the concept and i do think it's an interesting challenge and i think it's it's actually pretty impressive what they've done but you know just don't call it mastering i want to cap off this section of the interview before we get to reddit stuff which if you're still if you still have time for i think we we're, we're almost at the top of the hour um it's kind of a question about mentorship and career development and i don't see you get this question that often so that's why i'm asking it um i just want to say that i, I feel like the way that it used to be was, uh, you know, people came up through the ranks because things like career development and mentorship and just capital D development were sort of possible. Um, and now I feel like that stuff is a bit harder to find. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what role mentoring played in your uh, career as a, as a mastering artist and maybe uh, how people can get into it now if maybe mentorship isn't as available as, as it used to be or as um maybe not available but it, it's not as easy to find as it used to be yeah it's i mean with hindsight it was huge for me mm. um the so the studio where i worked had uh five studios t three of them were mastering studios uh only two of them had the the 1630 processor and the umatic tape systems that you needed at that point to actually make a master to go and be pressed to CD. So, and, and my studio was not one of them. So the one that I, uh, what I was doing initially was I was mastering to that digital audio tape, the tiny little digital formats. Um, that DAT would then go to another studio where a different engineer would copy master it. So just a, a flat transfer across onto the Umatic and they would then add the PQ data I mean, I, I gave them timings, so they typed all of those in. They would just check the timings to make sure that everything was fine. Um, so it was a face, uh, you know, effectively a technical process. But what that meant was that uh, a much more experienced engineer was listening to everything that I did. Um, and that meant that I was in the kind of unusual situation that I was probably mastering within three or four months of having started work there. Um, but, you know, a certain amount of what I did got kicked straight back to me um, with some comments that I would then, you know, uh, have to take on board and learn from. So, you know, I just had this constant feedback process of uh, to, to help me. And and I had these other engineers there who I could ask their advice. You know, I would go through and ask, you know, Nick or whoever, you know, what do you think of this? How would you treat this? How can you and we would have a conversation, you know, we would share techniques and strategies. And as time went on, I mentored other engineers. And, you know, with hindsight, I was incredibly lucky because that that kind of that whole model, that whole system of working is on its way out. It's pretty much gone. There are a few places where you can still get a position where you could ha actually have a real life mentor, but they're, they're few and far between. Um, so, yeah, I feel very lucky to have to have had that. Um, if somebody wants to try and get that themselves these days, I think you have to accept you're going to have to work for free. Um, I think you have to get some kind of experience. You have to, if, if somebody came to me, I'm not in a position to offer positions for trainees or, or to mentor anybody. Um, but if I were, and somebody came to me and said, oh, I've been to this college, I have this qualification, I've done this, this, and this, I would say, okay, that's all great now show me the examples you know let me hear yeah. the demos that you've done the recordings that you've done of your friends bands <clears throat> uh recordings of live gigs you've mixed whatever it is i want to uh it's not enough for me to see a piece of paper that says you can do stuff i want to hear so anybody who's out there and interested in doing this stuff start building up a portfolio now you know and do loads of stuff so that you can pick the very best of it to present to somebody to show it as an example of what you can do um, because you know not everything you do is going to be great uh you know not every studio we record in has fantastic sound or the best gear or the best mics um everybody has good and bad days you know you need to you need to put in the hours so that you can 
choose the best stuff to present somebody and if i think the other hint i have would be to do stuff in person um i wrote 50 100 something letters to different studios trying to get work um back when i was starting out um but the the reason i got the job at srt where i was trained as a mastering engineer was basically because i had been working for free at a studio around the corner from where my parents lived um and when srt phoned the the guy i was working for there um he said i don't want to tell you where he is because i want him to work for me which is probably the best possible recommendation but he was a lovely guy who understood that actually he wasn't in a position that he was going to be able to pay me a wage um so he did tell them where i was and and they were able to find me and i got the job but you know it was that personal connection so if find you know get your own gear or find a, a way into a place that has the gear so that you can do the work and you can start building up a reputation and just be incredibly useful to who whoever it is you're working with or for so that you have some recommendations um and if you're trying to get a position like that you know i think there's a lot to be said for just turning up on the door right um you know uh, a, a good email maybe has a chance these days uh, a bad email doesn't you know if you get if i get an email that doesn't have any capital letters or punctuation in it i delete it before i get to the end um the, the same is going to be true for a load of people out there so if you're going to kind of do it via the online route make sure what you present is fantastic you know have a website where people can go and watch video clips of what you've done or play audio samples so it's just really easy for them that kind of stuff but yeah, if there's somewhere local to you, I think going and introducing yourself, like because the place that I was working then, I uh, I went to see the guy almost immediately. I because um, I was staying with my parents at the time, um, and he said, "Well, you know, I'm really sorry. You know, thank you for for asking, but I already have somebody working with me." Um, and I ended up going to a thing that he ran after schools uh, for kids at the local college, and I would go along to that, and I would. I would get to use the gear, which is what he was offering and, and, you know, chat to him. But I would also stay back afterwards and just help him clear up, um, you know, and, and chat to him because I just wanted to be there. Um, and after two or three months of that, then he said, you know what, now so-and-so is gone. So I do have a place that you could come. And because I was the person who was there being helpful, being useful, being enthusiastic, I was the person he asked. So, you know, I think it's a lot harder to say no to somebody's face than it is to say no to an email or, or yeah. letter. So, um, yeah, those, you know, that, those are my suggestions. And the other thing, of course, is you can look at my website and uh, use some of my info products. I mean, I do this, this thing called the Home Mastering Masterclass, which is a, an eight-week online course. There's not a feedback element. I can't, I don't have the bandwidth to mentor people. You know, if I was, if I was going to do that, I'd have to charge 10 times as much. But you get to see me master eight or nine songs uh different songs different genres different software different plugins um it's all done in a home studio environment so it's kind of it translates to the people who are trying to do this stuff and i just kind of go through cover as many bases as i can so you know and and, and of course there's other people who have great resources out there as well so you can use resources like that to help you get better results in what you're doing um and and kind of you know match your stuff up against what i'm doing or what somebody else is doing to see whether you're achieving similar uh results excellent okay um if it's still okay with you speaking about people's questions and people who want to learn more about mastering there's this little subreddit it's not little it's about 160,000 uh subscribers um, which reddit is this it's we are the music makers oh yeah okay i know that. yeah so i posted there and i said that i'd be interviewing you and I post it to your plugins and the website and everything like that. And people know who you are and some don't, but they all had questions about mastering. And I sort of, I put them into sort of themes so that we don't get the same questions over and over. Um, and also there's some questions which I'm just not going to ask you because I'd like to shepherd, pun intended, uh, as many people as I can over to your excellent podcast where, for example, someone asks, you know, should I use a limiter? I think the very second mastering show you did was all about limiting and how to use them effectively so just for anyone watching this if your question wasn't answered please go 
uh, and listen to the podcast, not just for the whole in-depth conversation, but at the end of almost every single one, I think, Ian, you offer a mastering maxim, right? Yeah. And that's... Uh, try to. Try to, yeah. And I have to say, the information in those uh, in those maxims, I mean, it's invaluable. I do a little thing where I listen to people's mixes on this show, and uh, I've been able to sort of... My, my feedback has been much more informed, specifically with respect to loudness and stuff like that, having watched your uh, videos and listened to the podcast. The podcast was like my gateway drug, and it's terrific. So if you have a little bit of time, we'll just go over a couple questions. So let's start with the first question, which is basically, what do you do when the intro of a song is very quiet compared to the climax? How do you balance it out uh, without smashing the climax too much with limiting and compression? Do you use automation? Is it okay to use automation? In mastering I think it is um, and I use it um, other mastering engineers might tell you no it isn't you know I mean it's that, that's a taste thing um, it's kind of interesting there's you know there are mastering engineers who barely touch the material they work on and there are mastering engineers who completely transform it I'm kind of somewhere in the middle um, I I don't want to move stuff too far away from what the original artist's intent was, but I'm not afraid to roll my sleeves up if necessary. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I use especially level automation. Occasionally I'll use different EQ settings for different sections of a song if necessary. But I think when you get to that point, maybe it's the kind of you're getting towards the area where you need to say to somebody, actually, it might be better to, to make some changes in the mix because you're possibly trying to achieve too much at the mastering stage. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I even use automation in situations where actually the ba the dynamics going in were working reasonably well. Um, but what you sometimes find is that you just can't find a setting that works perfectly on, say, the verse and the chorus. Mm. Um, you know, either the chorus gets ends up getting overprocessed, or the verse just doesn't have quite enough processing. So yeah, just gentle. Now, I mean, I would say I'm probably only talking about changes of two or three dbs on the i don't tend to automate the plugins i tend to automate the input so you know if the classic example is where you've got the verse sounding great and then the chorus comes in and it's just pushing too hard against all of the processing the interesting thing is quite often when you pull that level back at the input to the mastering chain you'll find that the processing all kind of relaxes you know the compressors back off slightly there's less overall gain processing it doesn't actually sound any quieter even though you reduce the input gain right because you're you're pushing it up against this processing that is then holding it back mm. so there's a law of diminishing returns at that point so you ease the input level back the whole thing kind of relaxes and opens out and breathes a bit more sounds just as loud probably sounds better because it's got more space to work in so um yeah absolutely uh, automation i mean not not kind of not on every master by any means maybe one in ten perhaps but yeah if that's what it needs that's what i do and i think that it's probably maybe your intuition as someone who's done this for a long time that guides you to know whether or not you should make that choice at all that's not something that you just go i think i'm gonna try some it's something where you've you've trained your ears now to sort of know when the right moment might be to use something like that right yeah it's um i mean mastering has always been a question of me scratching an itch um so I mean, when I first started working as a mastering engineer, I didn't even know what it was. But with hindsight, uh, prior to that, you know, I would get, I was remastering uh, bootlegs of <laughs> live gigs. That I, and I just had two kind of, back then they were called ghetto blasters. Now they're called boom boxes, right. or maybe they don't even exist anymore. But one of them had a five band graphic EQ. And I would record from one cassette to another cassette and tweak the settings as I went through, you know. Or I would take cassettes to pieces and, bend the the metal thing that pushed the tape against the head to get firmer contact with the head to get better high frequency response um and if i had a cassette where the azimuth was off or the left channel wasn't quite right or a, a, an lp with too much end of side distortion i would it would just be i just kind of sit there feeling uncomfortable towards the end of it so <laughs> that's kind of just extended through and i've made a career out of that kind of right needing to fix that problem um but yeah it's I mean, what, what, to, 
if you can you can use your eyes to a certain extent in the sense that if you have something that basically sounds okay and then you get to the chorus and it still may be sounding okay but you're just seeing the compressor is always in compression it's never relaxing the gain back or you know way too much gain reduction happening or the limiter is working really hard those are all warning signals that actually maybe i should maybe i should just see how it sounds if i change the settings there especially when you're learning you know um in the same way that you might look at a graphic uh, an, an, an analyzer and kind of go well that kind of looks like it doesn't have enough 100 hertz let me just mm -hmm. see what happens if i put a bit in uh i've got to the stage now where that's all kind of just built in it's like driving a car you know i have no idea that i'm changing gear or right indicating or any of the rest of it and the same when i listen to music but back in the day when i was learning that was a very much a kind of a conscious process of thinking about is there enough of this that and the other okay you know so uh ultimately it becomes an instinct but i think it's possible to learn it i should say that if you like ian's metaphors you should fill your boots with the podcast because that uh punching bag metaphor with compression is amazing and yeah I, i'm really proud of that i have to say it's yeah. uh it, 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 that really works that that analogy and um, i think i think anybody who wants to listen to the podcast should go to the mastering show.com or check in the show notes you can do either one i will have everything we're talking about here uh but it, compression is such a misunderstood concept and it can be so artistic and stuff only if you understand what it can do unless you you know get it then it's, it's hard to make use of the tool anyway i just i won't spoil some of the stuff you, you put in the uh, the podcast so the next question um if my right channel this person says is 10.1 dr and my left channel is 9.8 dr can i still be proud of supporting dynamic range movement or should i commit sudoku i think he means seppuku but sudoku is like a funny meme or something actual question it bothers me does that make sense yeah what he's saying so by dr he means the difference between the peak level and the loudness of the music you can measure loudness using rms or VU meters or LUFS, which are the newest loudness things. And basically what he's saying is if one, if the left channel is slightly more dynamic than the right, is that a problem? And the answer is no, because it depends on the mix. Uh, if you've got, uh, let's say, a heavily compressed drone guitar in the left channel and some kind of spiky, choppy, apologize, spiky, choppy, uh, rhythm guitar in the other channel the rhythm guitar is going to be more dynamic it's going to have more variation in loudness um it's going to measure more dynamic on the meters than the drone guitar that doesn't mean they don't work perfectly well together musically um so yeah absolutely and you know um a difference of eight dbs between the peak and the loudness is the minimum that i would recommend so if you have nine and ten then you're you're good i would say good to go in the clear my question would be related to his Dynameter plugin. I've seen that a lot of tracks I get are already exceeding his recommended dynamic ranges, even without um, limiting when I receive the tracks. From a production standpoint, is the only way to get healthy dynamic range related to the arrangement, aka space in between the notes? He has mentioned Uptown Funk, which obviously has minimal instrumentation, uh, as one of his examples, as a loud dynamic mix. Can someone bring dynamics into a more wall of sound type situation during production and mixing and i think by wall of sound he means typical big chorus pop modern rock alternative thing where the choruses and everything is really sort of filled with instrumentation yes next question no <laughs> um the, uh, the it depends exactly where his question is coming from if he's saying he's trying to master stuff and people are sending him super squashed mixes that's a challenge. There are things that you can do to make stuff sound more dynamic, um, but it's always better to have something more dynamic going in so that you're controlling how much you, uh, you're in charge of how much you control those dynamics um, as opposed to trying to rescue something that's already been crushed. Um, having said that, I mean, the classic example uh, is EDM because most EDM is made from... Um, either heavily processed samples or people are using a lot of sample libraries or they're using stuff that comes from synths or sample packages or virtual instruments. Most of these things have already had a ton of dynamic processing done on them. So quite a common question I get from people is I'm producing electronica 
um, I'm not using any compression or limiting at all, and already I'm seeing uh, lower dynamic uh, content in the music than you recommend. Is that a problem? Um, and I would say, no, that's not a problem, but it's an opportunity. Um, because I think something that's very common that I see, I don't do so much mixing these days, but when I do, I just remember what I learned back when I did more, which is I only consider a mix finished when I can look at every bar in the song mm. and have a reason why stuff sounds the way that it does. Um, so, you know, because the, the temptation these days is to, uh, especially because you've kind of, kind of got this static display on a computer screen, you try and get everything set perfectly so you can press play and it plays through from beginning to the end and it sounded great. And that's not what happened back in the day. You know, back in the day, you'd have five or six people on a mixing desk with everybody riding the faders, adjusting dials and stuff, trying to get the perfect take. A mix was more like a performance. Um, or you had something more like, say, the Ken, well, actually, multiple engineers that I've heard, uh, it turns out, work the same way that I did when I was mixing, quite often, because I had did lots of DVD mixing at one point, where I had to get things done as quickly as possible. And what I would tend to do is get a setting that worked for a song, record it into the computer until things started to fall apart. Then I would stop, fix it, figure out what was going for the next section, then record that back in and then tidy up the edit later. So actually I was mixing in chunks and then editing them through to make a, and I've since learned that uh, that's the way that uh, Ken Scott works, uh, worked, legendary engineer, worked with the Beatles and so many other, Bowie, so many other artists. Um, it's the way CLA works, mm -hmm. um, except he does it with automation. There's a ton of different engineers who, who work in that way. And that's the kind of exact opposite of just having one setting that runs all the way through the song, right? That's a kind of dynamic thing, different meaning of the word dynamic. It evolves through the song. Um, and these days you could store presets. So if you had different sections of the song that were similar, you could use those to, to move back and forth. But if you have something where your raw ingredients are not very dynamic, look for ways to introduce dynamics. Do you have enough contrast in the arrangement, you know, um, or can you introduce some, say, some live percussion? Um, one of my favorite things is blending electronic instruments with live instruments. I mean, maybe you just sample them or you use something quirky, you know, some kind of found sound or some kind of a vocal sample or whatever. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. If you're really, really pleased with the way that it sounds and it just doesn't have a huge amount of dynamics, that's great. You know, I mean, the, that's fine, especially if you're not processing it too hard to to get that way. But if there's room for more dynamics, why not try and exploit that? Um, so there is actually a post on the site, which you could include in the show notes, um, specifically on that topic about EDM and introducing more dynamics into EDM that has a bunch of different ideas that people might be interested in. And they, those could probably be adapted to other genres as well. Biggest mistakes people make in the home mastering sessions related to loudness and not related to loudness. And that's a big, big answer there, but tailor well, it down however you like. Related to mass, to, related to loudness is just making it too loud, mm -hmm. overusing whatever process, you know, the L1 or the PSP Vintage Warmer or the Ozone or T-Rex or whatever it is, just pushing it too hard. Um, not related to loudness, I think. That's interesting. Um, I kind of see it's it's interesting because there there are mastering engineers who just kick everything back. First mix comes in and they say, yeah, you did this, <clears throat> excuse me, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, go back and do it again. Their clients love them for it. That's not the kind of engineer that I am. Um, I tend to try and respect what people have sent me. Mm -hmm. I assume that they have put the the most effort they could into getting the result that they wanted, um, and and I work with that unless there's some major problem. So. If something came in and uh, I don't know, some element of the mix was really quiet or um, something was EQ'd really oddly or whatever, I wouldn't necessarily say that was a mistake. I would say that was a creative decision, you know, and I would assume that that's the way that if it was really bizarre, I mean, occasionally you get something like, say, one of the instruments is in antiphase, so where you hit the mono button and it right. disappears completely. That to me, even if it's a creative decision, is a mistake because even in this day and age, stuff gets played on devices that only have one speaker. 
the mix is going to radically change depending on whether it's in stereo or not. So at that point, I would say, is this the way you intended it? You know, is it? And I might query it. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say there's a trend in terms of other stuff that people do. I think I think generally over processing. Um, so loudness processing, but also other stuff, be it. Um, well, the classic one, my, my kind of bugbear at the moment is the, the sort of saturation tape emulation, mm -hmm. everybody going the, for the, the analog warmth thing. Um, you know, analog warmth, things like tape saturation and pushing consoles really hard and stuff had an element to play in the sound of all of those classic albums that we love, but it's only like 10 or 20% of the story. You know, there's a whole other raft of stuff, most of which is to do with balanced EQ and great arrangements um, that achieves those results. And I think people there's a temptation to kind of assume that, okay, we have this and then we can make it sound, we can give it analog warmth by putting it through that process. And that for me is just nonsense. Um, so yeah, that's a stuff that's just been pushed too hard through those kind of things is a, uh, something I see a lot of. And I think we had a question related to when do you know whether to kick something back down the chain to the mixing, but I think we've answered that a couple of times, right? Yeah. For, for me, it's fairly rare, but um, it's, it's when there's something that I can't get a result that I'm happy with. I always try and get, I, I always take what I'm given and try and get the best result. And if it gets to a point where I think, well, I just think that could be better. That's when I, so I'll say, here's what I've done with what you've given me. Um, are you interested in the idea of trying something where X, Y, Z, um, you know, and then the client gets back and says yes or no. And we, we take it from there. Um, I don't have any more questions. Well, that, wraps the whole thing up for me uh thank you so much again i'm thrilled that you came to talk to me and i think people are going to learn a lot and i think they'll think of this conversation as a super productive one so thank you so much ian shepherd no thank you it's my pleasure thanks for asking me